Hi and welcome to a new episode of the State of the Net podcast. I'm Paolo Valdemarin. And I'm Ewan Semple. And we are only one week into the quarantine. Like the compulsory one. I've well, been well, home well, for I, I two th- weeks. I thought you were going to say it's only a week since we did the last podcast, which is almost more remarkable. That is incredible. The thing is, we've had such nice feedback in the last week on the <laughs> last episode that that we thought, all right, let's do it again. Uh, <laughs> Somebody but, out there liked it. <laughs> so, yeah. So, and, and we really appre- I really appreciate the feedback in a sense. Totally. That, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, you know, I especially liked one of the comments that you got, which it did feel like it's exactly what we're trying to do, you know, making, you know, just posting a conversation with folks, t- chatting and yes. swearing and, a bit. And, and the and comment laughing. was about feeling feeling inclined to interject. And I've, I've had people say that before. They may be walking their dog, listening to us and find themselves you know, sort of arguing back or ch- ch- chipping in and then realizing they're in, on their own in the middle of a park. Yeah. We should f- try to find a way to get some guests on the show. I was thinking that, yeah, we should do. Um, because, I'm, you know, I, I'm not in the sense that so many podcasts have where it's a sort of celebrity or special guest or whatever, but just, you know, we've got an interesting network of interesting people that we both know and that, that we would be having interesting conversations with anyway. And in that sort of spirit, it'd be great to get more people involved. So if you're listening to this and you want to be the third musketeer, get in touch. <laughs> A rolling vacancy. Yeah. Um, something that I wanted to chat about that uh, I, I I kind of found peculiar was this, uh, the letter from Boris. Uh, mm. I, I haven't gotten it yet. Uh, I didn't even know if I No, I, I haven't it. either. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but yesterday on the news, they were saying that uh, there is a letter sent to 30 million Britishers basically telling people to stay home, resist. I mean, it's it's just a communication stunt. Uh, but apparently, the letter is on a ten Downing Street uh, paper, and it's you know signed by Boris. And I was thinking about the timing of this. You know, in order to send out thirty million letters, they must have started working on this uh, sometime at the beginning of last week. What happened at the end of last week is that Boris caught it and he <laughs> tweeted about it, which means that uh, now everybody is receiving something that it, we know that he was nowhere near that letter, but that letter is meant to f- look and feel like it's coming from the man. And you're yes, basically getting yes, a letter from somebody with, it's like, Ugh. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to <laughs> open this thing. And I would, Imagine the poor postman touching hundreds of them. Yeah, to, to thirty million apparently, and it's yeah. and it's and it was. Uh, I I just thought it was funny because it's little. It's you know like the clash of two different words, yeah. where on one side you have the letter that it took time to prepare, to print, to post, and uh, then when he got something, he tweeted about it, and the message reached immediately. Pretty much everybody, because you know, even if you're not on Twitter, if you're, everybody was talking about it, and yeah. so you have this uh, conflict of uh, of the speed of the two communication tools that uh, created this awkward situation. Well, it's not just. Fun. I mean, it's it's not just that. I mean, I, and this is going to sound like a bit of a leap, but I'm sort of feeling the same about mainstream news these days that it's this sort of slightly antiquated way of communicating and they still have legacy attitudes. You know, it's the kind of sonorous tones and the, the doom-laden music behind the headlines. And and then you get this sort of partial, not terribly informative list of things to be afraid of. And meantime, and you know, I know I can hear people saying all about the misinformation on the internet, but equally we are all being able to access information faster than ever before and you know because I make an effort and have a good network of people and I'm pretty good at weeding out signal from noise I'm feeling very well informed about what's going on and what the options are and and sometimes again you know we've talked about this before being able to see differences of opinion is not a bad thing because you can understand that it's complex and there are more than one 
instead of assumptions being made about it. And uh, so, you know, it's, it's, it's funny, isn't it? There is still that need, I guess. You know, there are still people who aren't as online as the rest of us. There's maybe all the folks who are less used to, or maybe want the reassurance of a real letter, or they want, you know, my parents are still watching the, the six o'clock news uh, on a regular basis because it's almost like an obligation that they have. And as you say, it's the contrast between that and the fact that this new way of doing things is just taking off our weight of knots. I think that the main challenge is that um, we are really seeing complexity at work here in the mm -hmm. sense that, uh, you know, I, I've been reading f articles about, uh, you know, how do you prevent this and, you know, what different things different government uh, should have done. But the truth is that there are the, the complexity of managing an epidemic is huge. It's not mm -hmm. like it's what you decide, when you decide, the implication that you have are so hard to predict that uh, everybody's struggling. And, uh, yeah. and of course they are. But, but on the other hand, you have the media that try to explain and, you know, as usual, when you try to simplify complexity, you end up with the wrong explanations or with the <laughs> simplification the where there shouldn't be. Yeah. So well, I found it interesting yesterday, for example, somebody on, on because I actually I do end up uh, for the first time in my life. I'm watching the six o'clock news um, and it's uh, there was somebody trying to say, look, we don't know, but we're going to check in three weeks and uh, it can it will probably take at least six months before we get back to normal. But we don't know. So these mm -hmm. are just order of magnitude, I'm telling you, but uh, but we will see how it actually goes. We need to see the data. And when she said that, I understood exactly what she, she meant. I said, yeah, OK, um, thanks was that, for was that the deputy health minister. Yes, I think so. Because she, she's, she's great. I mean, she just says what she means in plain language, manages exactly. to sound empathetic and, and authoritative exactly. at the same time. Fantastic. I mean, yeah. That's how but, you do it. but the thing is that, you know, I got this explanation and, uh, you know, in, in my own tiny little job, I'm asked uh, when something will be ready or when something will be done all the time. And I, str and I try to mm. explain to people, well, it's probably going to take this order of magnitude of time, but we don't know. I'll be able to tell you more when I have more information. The mainstream media this morning was reporting, oh, she said we're going to be stuck at home for six months. <laughs> it's like, no, this, this is absolutely that's not, that's not, not what she said. What she said. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, yeah. uh, but, you know, you need to simplify that message and the simplification of the message, just stupidity. And, it's fascinating, uh, isn't it? I mean, this is partly why I've just been reading lots of more stuff around Dave Snowden's uh, Ganefin framework, which mm -hmm. I think we've talked about on here. But oh, it's that's, a way of that's how you pronounce it? I, I I got it from the horse's mouth. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I'll just I, in my head I've always say, been saying something different. How is it? I'm not, I've not got nervous because I'm Canadian. Okay. Um, I'm pretty sure that's what Dave says, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure. I've never lost no panic. If it, it comes from the horse. Yeah, but um, you know, it's, which for those who don't know is a, 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 an attempt or a, a methodology for mapping out different types of. Uh, behaviors and organizations and levels of complexity that allows you to understand which you're in at a particular time and how to respond to it and a lot of that is about the differences between complex and complicated and what's blindingly obvious and simple but what may be um, hard to manage but still manageable um, he has a quadrant on his he hates, he hates me calling it a 4 by 4 because he's always slacking off consultants with 4 by 4s But anyway, the bottom left of his one is, is about um, chaos, mm -hmm. you know, where you've got unpredictability at, at a high degree. But the reason I mention it is that I think in these current circumstances, it's just a very useful way of trying to work out what type of situation you're in because, as you said, it's so easy to either be blind to what's happening because you've got such a fixed view of how the world should be or out of your depth because you've got no language or means of talking about what's happening that's relevant to, to the circumstances. And, you know, again, it's not 
even even his model is not one size fits all. The fact that it could be applied to an organisation, it could be applied to a situation, it could be applied to a country for that matter. And I think a lot of the trick, and I was talking to somebody else this morning about maybe doing some work around, you know, it's so, it, it sounds perilously close to ambulance chasing, but when, once things begin to emerge from this, and I didn't deliberately say get back to normal because I hope they don't, but as we emerge from this current period, I think there will be a lot of opportunities to look at things differently and to help people capitalise on this, get the, get the good out of this. You know, the fact that people are suddenly having to learn to work remotely, they're having to learn the etiquette of video camera communication. And, you know, I posted a question this morning about what, what is an organisation? And for many people, it was this idea that you go to work and you go to a building and the building is the organisation. But we've sort of blown that apart at the moment. So, you know, as I say, it's just that, that out of any crisis, there are opportunities to learn and do things better. And so I think some of the tools like Dave's and and it'll just change how, I, you know, I really hope it changes how we see the world. Well, I think that probably we could at least hope that, um, you know, some decision makers will start having a better understanding of uh, of complexity because you know I, I think that the problem is not just being you know having a knowledge about a specific topic it's also about being comfortable with complex things and being comfortable yeah. with uh, a certain level of uncertainty and maybe with the fact that there are things you do, so you simply don't know but you can just uh, you know, have a structure of knowledge around that. So, yeah. you know, I don't, I'm, I'm not a immunologist. I don't know what she was talking about, but at the same time with that uh, vice minister were talking, I, I, I could understand t the complexity of what she was trying to, to explain. Yes. So having more people a little bit more comfortable with not knowing things, which is essentially, essentially the situation we are all in. We don't know because no, nobody has experienced this before. We're trying to figure this thing out. And of yeah. course, this is exciting from some point of view because this is when new stuff comes out. But um, mm -hmm. on the other hand, I can appreciate how it's... Uh, it's scary uh, from f for many others. And, uh, you know, if you think about it, when there has ever been a disease that has touched so many people all at the same time on the whole planet? Yeah. I mean, except Facebook. Yeah. But it's, it, well, that's, <laughs> that's another aspect of it that's interesting. I, I, it's maybe just my imagination, but I see people using the word digital less because, you know, what the hell does digital mean when it's all there is? Um, you know, ev everything's digital, and it's 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 been obvious to some of us for a long time. But when your only means of achieving anything, or connecting to anybody, or buying anything is is through the devices, then you stop seeing it as this separate alien thing. You know, so that, that would be another good thing to come out of all this. And this is interesting. It's a uh, when will the language change, and we will stop saying working from home and just say working. Yeah. For example. Yeah. yeah. And, but it's actually just when you were talking there about the, I suppose, in a sense, unforeseen consequences of some of this, I was talking to another listener over the weekend about age. And uh, Garrett lives in New Mexico and he was finding a very stark contrast between the, uh, the Native American population of that state who are very respectful of their elders and are concerned that people who are you know, trying to escape lockdown by disappearing into the hills are in fact at risk of bringing the infection to their old people who they're trying very hard to protect. And you com compare that with the, was it the Texas governor who was basically saying that the old folks owe it to the rest of us to just gracefully disappear so that we can maintain the economy. Um, you know, it is really interesting when you get under pressure like this, what surfaces and what both good and bad. I mean, the whole thing about the people standing out on the balconies the other night there to, to clap the NHS was to a scale that I don't think anybody would have anticipated. Um, so this, as, as ever, is bringing out both the best and the worst in us.
Well, it's definitely bringing a lot of new behaviors because we are forced into it. So we are forced into trying to express ourselves in different ways, using our time in different ways, share, you know, how many houses of people I've seen over the last few weeks that I'd never seen before because you, you call people and you see them in their kitchen. It's. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that it is interesting yeah. because we're we're moving a lot of uh, boundaries uh, and uh, a lot of things that were so firmly established forever, and they are now completely disappearing. I don't know if they will come. I mean, I think most will come back. Most will, you know, we will try to go back to where we were before. Yeah. But yeah. at the same time, I, I suppose that one of the big questions is how much impact uh, this is going to have on the economy in the mm -hmm. sense that uh, if what we is going to happen is you know a gap in the gdp and then we're going to bounce back and everything will more or less go back to to normal probably some things will change for the best if this is going to become worse than that then yeah, I'm not sure. I mean, there, there, there might be some pretty bleak scenarios. Well, I was reading something about the European Union and how in the early days when Italy was desperately trying to get hold of ventilators and masks, not only did France and Germany uh, not respond, they actually put a block on export of those things, um, which they've since lifted, but that was their initial reaction. Meanwhile, China is shipping these things to Italy, you know, so I think that whole I have political dimension of this is is going to be interesting what it does to the tensions between countries and who helps who and why. And I have an optimistic thought. I, I, so the, the news yesterday was that uh, Albania is sending 30 doctors and nurses to Italy and uh, the Albanian president uh, gave a speech in Italian um, saying that uh, even if we're a small, poor country, um, we appreciate how Italy helped us uh, back in the day. Remember the big immigration? And, mm -hmm. uh, and there are many Albanians in Italy, and we think that, uh, you know, this is a small thing, but because we don't need them here yet, we don't have the emergency here yet, we want to help our Italian brothers and sisters, and That's okay, good. it nice. I mean, it's 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 uh, it it was interesting. But what I found potentially more interesting is the fact that he was saying, "We're sending these people over because we don't need them here yet." And if you think about it, it's of course you're preparing for the worst, but uh, until it happened. You know, you have resources, you have people, you have ventilators, and they're not used yet. Now, yeah. once we get on the other side of the curve, and uh, unfortunately, Italy will probably get there before others because they started earlier, probably you will find yourself with surplus of ventilators, right? Yes. Now, that would be a huge opportunity to be nice to others and make the <laughs> yes. difference i don't know if that is going to happen but you know if you think about especially if you think about the you know this the shape of this kind of a, it's a sort of a bell curve i mean it's yeah. it just has it got up very quickly it will probably go down very quickly so at some point they will find themselves okay at that point all medical stuff will be completely exhausted but in terms of for example ventilators they will probably have plenty of unused ventilators and you know you want to keep some around because it might come back but you know if at that yeah. point uh, other countries will be experiencing the they will be at the top of the of the bell they will need any help they can get so i'm well not not just ventilators but experience and exactly <clears throat> you know since the actually i was just talking to a friend in hong kong this morning and i had got the impression that they were sort of past the worst but he was saying it's having another uh, it's, it's ebbing and flowing it's coming back again and that's partly because so many people returned to hong kong from european countries that are now infected mm -hmm. <clears throat> so they're seeing it resurging again so 
again, you know, that whole mobility that we've become used to, um, even just the pleasure of being able to look up in the sky, being relatively close to Heathrow as we are here, not see planes, or if there is one, it's unusual, you know. Um, well, I mean, you know, the not, theory not, that I cannot not go not home f- is quite <laughs> unusual. <laughs> Sorry, per- personal company excluded, yeah, Paul, yeah. But, you know. <laughs> but you know what I mean, it's just, it's, it's it, we're, sh- we're, we're sort of shrugging off decades, if not centuries, of assumptions or, you know, we have the potential to do that. Um, and, you know, again, it's a negative thought, but the longer this lasts, the more likely we are to benefit from the upsides of it, because we'll just be made to think harder about stuff that matters. Well, one would hope that we will start learning from each other and and grow, because I think that this situation is teaching a lot of things to a lot of people way faster yeah. than before yeah now you can smell the burning <laughs> exactly so you know while it is true that uh, in many cases it did not happen so you know italy didn't learn from china but i was reading this morning even you know in italy there are two regions uh, lombardy and veneto which are right one next to each other they are quite similar in terms of uh, you know the type of population and uh, infrastructure and one has 10 times as much dead people as the other interesting and uh, and the reasons are that the two regions in italy uh, healthcare is regional so it's managed at regional level they did things differently mm-hmm. so of course one was not able to learn from the other now it's starting to happen and it's starting to happen all over italy because you know you have the opportunity of one looking at the others and trying to 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 do better um of course in some situations if you look at what is happening in the states it does not <laughs> it's just about to leap there as well yeah, yeah it yeah. doesn't appear like they are they are learning but they will start learning and they will start learning fast well and this is where it's really again very fascinating the the prospect of you know trump presiding over America turning socialist, you know, um, where they suddenly realise that, that, that they need to look out for each other and to share. And, but then you get rearguard actions like, you know, I was reading today again about some, I think a pastor in the church, you know, basically saying it's, a, it's it, you know, this is a government conspiracy, that it's our right to go out and mingle and connect and anybody who wear, who uses hand sanitizer is a wuss, you know, and you think, oh my goodness, how on earth can you politicize something like this to that extent. I mean, I've seen all the conspiracy theories and yeah. you could argue some of the delays are maybe questionable, but for God's sake, people are probably dying know, about I this, know, I know, but is this, how many people are actually following this guy? I don't know. I mean, I, I, I think that sometimes the media like to find these nut jobs and oh, report for sure. about them. For sure. Um, so I mean, I, well, I'm not say, I'm not saying that people don't did not vote for pretty stupid things in the last few years, but yeah. uh, at the same time, I well, think that we should not exaggerate this situation. I, I I think that at this point there there is a majority, a sizable majority of people that uh, suddenly believes in science and uh, thinks that. Uh, well, it's okay if you're if you're right, you know, mea culpa, hands up, believing the rubbish on the internet but equally talking to some American friends and they're genuinely stunned at the level of support there still is for Trump oh yeah well yeah I mean you know so so it's it's not unfounded concern over this but again it's it's you know with any luck this will blow that set of myths apart as well um, well, if it's true you know. that he started, he started saying, "Well, you know, we can have a hundred thousand dead people," and it's like, what? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> but he's like preparing <laughs> for preparing the country for the, the these kind of numbers. It's uh, yeah. it's yeah, it's it's incredible what people will believe. Uh, uh, do, do you have any friends or family members sharing conspiracy theories? About 
about uh, the, the UK. Co- the, about the whole coronavirus, uh, how it was an engineered virus developed by the Chinese against the Americans, or the other way around. Well, I was going to say I've seen the other stories about the Americans being in China in Wuhan just before it broke out, and that the, the Americans haven't told them what happened. But because um, I, I well, again, I, I it, have had I, I, some of this, and it's like I'm right. so struggling to you know how do you deal with. It's like, oh, uh, th- thankfully, I haven't. Do, do yet, I have? Yeah. Do I have to debunk this? Uh, uh, yeah. But it's that sense of outrage, isn't it? I mean, we all get triggered, or it takes effort not to be triggered by some of this stuff. And I think that I think you know, that the, the outrage engine is still in full in full flow, isn't it? I think that there is a need of uh, believing that there it's something worse than. You know, simply a virus that yes, mutated ran, random, yeah. and randomly yeah. started killing billions of people. Even if it was, it was completely forecasted. I mean, in the sense that uh, there has been numerous uh, papers and uh, research yeah. and stuff saying, "Oh, it's not a matter of." If it happens, it's just a matter of when it happens, and when it happens, <laughs> it's almost like it's it, it's better. It, it's it's even it's better even if the bad guys are in charge than that nobody's in charge. Exactly, I think that I think that it makes everybody feel better if you say, "Oh, this is a conspiracy. This is the Chinese doing yeah. this, or the Americans doing this, or the Russian doing this." Yeah. <laughs> then say no one is it doing ma- it. Maintains the illusion of control, even if it's the wrong people doing yeah. it. Yeah. Well, no one is doing this. Basically, it's and just. It's, it's, I love the idea that we're we're the virus and COVID is is, the, the, is cure. the cure. Yeah, pretty much. I mean, you know, it's a in in a way, it's a very simple form of life, but it has a very successful behavior, and uh, mm-hmm. you know. I think that we created the environment for the virus to thrive. Yeah. Yeah. With all of our lifestyle things and whatever and the way we move around. And yeah, exactly. I mean, if it, 100 years ago, you know, a bunch of people would have died in somewhere in China. Nobody would have known. And actually, probably it did yeah. happen and nobody knew. Well, I mean, 100 yeah. years ago, we already had the the Spanish flu and that did kill a ton of people but that happened uh, part of that was because it was right after the war there is there was a, a very good article about this uh, a couple of weeks ago um kind of telling the story and apparently the way it started was uh, in a war hospital in france which was uh, mm-hmm. some huge uh, it was a tent in the mud where people and uh, animals were kind of kept together right. and uh, that created the perfect uh, you yeah, know that was sort of a petri dish to start a new a new virus and then of course a lot of people went back home from there yeah yeah and yeah. Uh, and uh, of course the level a very large part of the population were underfed and uh, um, this, of course, created and I mean the the numbers of the Spanish flu are totally respectable for a virus. Oh yeah, yeah. It did they did pretty pretty well. It is interesting that whole you know it sort of challenges so many of our ideas of progress, doesn't it? I mean, in the sense that. We are creating conditions where these things can propagate faster because of our technologies and our, our, our lifestyles, but then we're also able to learn and respond faster. You know, there's always this, this kind of giveth and taketh away kind of thing that goes on, isn't it? You know, and, and you wonder at the end of the day what the sum total in terms of well-being and happiness is. I mean, it's... Wow. I mean, I, I just thinking again about the, the way we might learn from this is people sort of being forced <clears throat> to do nothing and seeing a lot of people resisting all the hype about 10 top ways to be effective while you're still at home sort of thing and <clears throat> just basically saying, come on, chill. <laughs> There's nothing to, you know, you don't have to be on that treadmill currently because it's been taken away from you. Um, 
And it's just interesting watching people adapting to that and how we get so used to stopping ourselves. You know, being bored is the worst thing people can imagine for themselves. And I think a lot of our problems end up coming out of the fact that we're all so bloody busy doing things and buying things and going places and all of it trying to just stop the nightmare of being left sitting thinking, you know? Yeah, I must say that even if I'm coping quite well, everything considered, you know, me knowing myself, <laughs> I mean, I'm mm -hmm. I'm not freaking out at all. I'm actually... I can't say I'm enjoying this, but I mean, I'm 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 doing pretty well. well. I'm on the brink of saying. Yeah, that. I mean, yeah. I didn't go. Yeah. I I went out today to get some groceries, but that was the first time I went out since last Tuesday or Wednesday. So you know, it's uh, I'm not really struggling. I'm not even going out for a walk, even if I could. I'm just like, um, look, mm -hmm. let's just stay home. It's gonna be fine. Yeah. Um, yeah. On the other hand, I might say that I I cannot read a book like i tried to pick up a book start reading oh I yeah just, attention yeah, yeah i'm struggling yeah, to focus on things uh, is really hard. strangely enough yeah. i can do audiobooks i mean i've been listening to a very interesting audiobook and uh and it's uh and and i can do that without any problems but uh sitting and reading ah that's difficult See, I'm the, I'm the other way around. I'm finding that I can still read, but listening to audiobooks or podcasts, I'm, I suppose it's partly because I normally listen to those when I'm doing something else, like walking around or or driving, which I'm not really doing at the moment. But it is interesting, that whole thing about attention span, and I noticed a couple of other people commenting that they're waking in the night, which I am. And it's not because I'm anxious. I'm not fretting. I'm not worrying about things in that way. But I also sort of suddenly found myself awake at like three or four in the morning for some reason. Well, that's a good time to listen to. A, I mean, the, my most audiobook consumption yeah, yeah. is uh, I go to I'm I have the app reading me to sleep, which is so, well okay. It 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 helps if you sleep alone, um, but uh, having somebody reading a story to go to bed it's just so nice. So I'm I'm yeah. listening to a book called uh, A Gentleman in Moscow. And it's um, the story in the 19... It starts in the 1920s of uh, Count Rostov, a Russian nobleman who is uh, has some kind of issue with the now ruling Communist Party and he is condemned to house arrest in the Hotel Metropole where he was living at the time, in Mo which is this fancy luxury hotel in Moscow. And and there are the stories. I mean, at this point is almost twenty years that he's living inside the hotel metropole, and it's interesting because when I picked up this book, I started listening to this before the beginning of all the story. Uh, so mm -hmm. I find myself reading the story of somebody who is in house arrest, which is kind of interesting, and uh, it resonates in many ways. It's it's very good if you have a chance. Uh, it's, uh, I'll, I'll put yeah. I'll put I'll post the yeah. link in the in the description. Definitely, as you know, podcasters say. So um, that seems like a good good positive note to to uh, finish on. Paula with a good, a good recommendation for something for people to listen to while they're maybe less less busy than they have been used to being. So who knows? We might we might manage to do another of these. Uh, in a week, Paolo, what do you reckon? Well, that's, you know, we're trying to do our best. We have time. We're getting so lovely feedback from our listeners. So, you know, let's continue doing this. There you go. We'll, we'll see you next time. Bye. -bye.